All right, um, I'm gonna say ETM Hotep. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our what would normally be our Divine Word, excuse me, our Freestyle Fridays, not Divine Words Wednesdays, but would normally be our Freestyle Fridays. But we're gonna switch it up tonight and uh, have a session of our Sabite Dome. And before we move any forward, any uh, further, I want to make sure I check out the technical aspect and make sure that everything is fine with the broadcast. And so if any of you all on the panel, if you can look at the YouTube stream and make sure that um, everything is okay, and then we can continue. Steve, we good. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so I'm not sure why. Yeah, on my end, it's, it's, it's showing that it's not good. So as long as we're good, as long as everyone can hear me. So if you are um, tuned in, I uh, really appreciate it because we just started. You know, give people time for, the, uh, for them to be notified and to tune in. Uh, but if you can hear me in the chat, please uh, let me know if the audio and the video is fine for you. All right, let's do, do that first, and then we'll move forward. So, um, and I know there's a delay, so I just want to wait until I get a confirmation from everyone in the chat to make sure everything is okay. Make sure you can hear everything and see everything. Yeah, it's a big delay, but I just looked it up. Uh, it looks good on my end on YouTube. All right. Fair enough. All right, yeah, so and uh, Jahudi Bakmat, you said all good here. Hotep, I bet. Hotep, right. Sam. Okay. Well, long as the, long as we are technically okay, then we can move forward. All right. So, um, again, I want to say ETM Hotep. Welcome, everyone, to our... Uh, Friday session. Normally we have Freestyle Fridays, uh, but we switch it up from time to time, and tonight is one of those times. So tonight we're going to do a Welcome to the Sabite Dome uh, session, and um, what these sessions are all about um, is a you know a creative spinoff of the Thunderdome. If if people can remember the movie uh, Mad Max uh, Beyond the Thunderdome with Mel Gibson and Tina Turner, and the Thunderdome was a, an arena uh, of gladiators where they battled out and handled their differences, you know. Um, so the Sabaite Dome, the word Seba means to teach or to instructions, and it also goes into the word for student uh, as well as teacher. So it has to do with uh, information and teaching. So it's the uh, arena of teaching, so we can straighten out information. And so we utilize this uh, these sessions to address claims that are made by people um, that are false or um, have misinformation in there. And we do it out of love for the community, our community, and for the, our progress, you know. So um, anytime that uh, someone is making false claims, you know, that's something that we shouldn't support. That's something that we should correct because at the end of the day, we want accurate information, we want quality information, and we want to expand the knowledge that we have. All right. So um, this is why we do what we do. And so it's not meant to uh, attack anybody directly or any, anything personal, or whatever. It's strictly dealing with information. Um, and we know how people can get, uh, especially on social media. Uh, the egos may um, inflate and flare up and people think that you're personally attacking them and so on and so forth. But that's not what we do. That's not uh, our cup of tea. Uh, if people feel that way, that's not our intent, uh, but it is what it is, and we will unapologetically um, move forward regardless. All right, so tonight um, we, are, we will be addressing uh, maybe one to, one to three uh, issues that was claimed or stated by the brother Zion Lex uh, recently in a video that was brought to our attention. Um, you know, someone asked us to check it out. And so um, some of the members of the panel um, have checked it out or uh, checking out different uh, statements that were made. And so we're going to address a few of them 
um, and maybe some more in the future. And not just with what he says, but with anybody, what they say um, regarding Kemet, its language and its culture. But before we move forward, um, well, I, well, I guess we can introduce ourselves, uh, those of us who are on the panel. Rini Wujau Meneb Erima'at. My name is Wujau Meneb Erima'at. Um, most people just refer to me as simply as Wujau. And so I'll be running point for tonight. And we have other uh, members on the panel. And you all can uh, unmute yourselves and just in introduce yourself. Then we'll move forward. ETM Hotep, welcome in peace, everybody. It's your brother, June. Um, thank y'all for tuning in. I hope y'all enjoy the show and leave with satisfaction. And if you do, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. I know we got uh, most of the people in here probably already subscribed. But if you haven't, uh, do that. I appreciate you. Hotep. Hotep. Reni Imiket. My name is Imiket. And um, just would like to welcome you to our you know, show. And ho hopefully you kind of leave satisfied like St. June's Day. So, Hotep. ETM Hotel for any Sean. Welcome in peace. My name is Sean. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in tonight. And uh, hopefully we all can leave with satisfaction and learn something. ETM Hotel, Dua Dua U, Dua Aku, Dua Nature, Rini E, Kofi, Paisa. We would just like to welcome, welcome, welcome you all to the show. All right, and I believe that's all we have on the panel for now. And uh, other members may uh, chime in at a later, uh, later time. All right, so let's move forward. And um, as our uh, custom uh, to do, we want to start off by a recitation of the offering formula. And we do this as a uh, ritual routine um, adopted from Dr. Riketi Amin, who also uh, does the same thing whenever uh, we gather together we um, will give the or recite the offering formula just to kind of set the tone for uh, the things that we discuss and things like that uh, so without further ado uh, Sonnet Imiket um, if you can re recite the offering formula sure um, so uh, as most of y'all are familiar uh, you know, well, I recite the, the offering formula. You can um, go ahead and recite it with me. And if you're not uh, familiar with um, the offering formula, I will just like to quickly uh, say that what you're looking at on your screen is um, the offering formula. And on the top part, you, what you see is the, is the hieroglyphic. And on the middle part is the, is the transliteration. And then the bottom part, that will be the translation. So what I am going to be reading will be the middle part, with, which is the transliteration. The pronunciation is tentative, and I know uh, Seba Ujao can go into that uh, when, I'm done, when I'm done. But um, this particular offering formula is um, done on behalf of the, of the ancestors, or what is known as the Aku. And you can include a name of any of your ancestors that, that you like to have as part of this um, recitation. So I'll just go ahead and recite it, and um, feel free to recite along. Hotep Tinesu, Weser Neb Chedu, Necha A Neb Abju, D F Bret Heru T Henket, Ka Aped Ches Menket, Het Nebet Neferet Wabet Anket, Necha Im, In Kani Imaku Aku Ma Heru. And what I just said is an offering the king gives Osiris, Lord of Chedu, Great God, Lord of Abydos so that he may give verbal offerings in beer, bread, ox, fowl, alabaster, and linen, everything good and pure on which a God lives, for the car of the revered ones, the ancestors, justified. And I'll pass the mic back to Asaba Uja. All right, Iker, um, Dua. All right, so um, that's how we usually start things off. And uh, also it's encouraged for those who are um, studying the culture and language of Kemet to also memorize the offering formula uh, because there are some benefits other than just to routinely um, recite it 
for what it says, but it also um, gives you some insight onto the language and it gets you used to different formulaic um, expressions. All right. So we're going to move uh, forward. And uh, tonight, again, it's welcome to the Sabaiyat Dome. And the Sabaiyat Dome is where misinformation and false claims related to ancient Kemet are addressed. So tonight we are going to address a few things that the brother Zion Lex has made a claim. And these claims are coming from a video that was recently done, uh, be believed by the brother Solomon on his channel uh, in the black radio, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, Zion Lex uh, did a presentation on Medu Netcher. Um, you know, and I don't know the brother to be a uh, teacher or even a uh, student or have a focus in um, in the language. So it was just interesting that when someone pointed out that um, that he did a lecture on it, you know, um, that kind of just uh, surprised me. So when I checked out a few of the claims that he made, you know, I found that that the brother has made um, quite a few errors. And, you know, it's understood um, because I believe the brother is learning. He said he's, he uh, has been learning or studying it for two and a half years. And in two and a half years, the um, kinds of uh, mistakes that I've heard him say, uh, the brother, I would suggest or encourage the brother to um, get under someone's wings who actually teaches the language. And I myself, I'm, I'm all for autodidacts, people who can learn on their own. But sometimes there's consequences to that. Uh, so it's always better to uh, be guided by someone who's more experienced or who um, has the qualifications and the competency in the language. So at least you know what you're doing or if you're on the right track or not. And so that's what I would encourage the brother to do after hearing um, some of the uh, mistakes that he made in this recent video and in a previous video that he did, uh, I believe, debating the brother Jabari. Um, the brother went over some portions of the uh, so-called Book of the Dead, the Papyrus of Ani, and his interpretation of what it's saying is not what he believes it's saying. And we would know that if we were to read and understand uh, the language and the culture of Kemet. Um, so those who actually put in the work and apply the rigor and the discipline and the time to study it on a regular basis um, are the people that he should uh, work with or consult with, you know, in terms of even his studies. So that's my um, word of advice to the brother. Uh, but because um, the channel is popular and things, we, we're going to take some time to address a couple of the claims. All right. So I will start off um, with a couple of claims. Now, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to play a clip of the video of what the brother is saying and then I will um, address it so give me a moment to make sure I um, get this now uh, the video that uh, was done I believe is over two hours long so we're not gonna go over the whole video so we're just gonna highlight a couple of the claims and then maybe we'll revisit it and do some more claims at a later date but just for tonight we're gonna do some some of the ones that um, kind of stuck out as I was scanning through the vi through the video. So here on the screen, um, I'm going to play this video and really I'm playing it for the audio so we can hear what the brother claims. But in this portion, just to kind of um, give some context to it, uh, the brother is, an, uh, is making an attempt to explain the Asiatics. And so he's talking about the word Amu and the Asiatics, and he's making some points about it that are incorrect. So we're going to take some time to listen and then I will um, address some of those claims. All right. So let me get over here and you all let me know if you can hear it. Some picture he grabbed online of what the people of Kem of painted the Hyksos to be. Are you all able to hear it? Two in here. Yes. All right, so I'm going to let it play, and then I'll, I'll pause it and then make some comments about it and uh, as we go along. But what I'm showing you in this graph is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York City, and it was taken directly from Kemet. And it shows you how the people of Kemet depicted Asiatics coming into Kemet. 
And guess what? Look at the complexion of these Asiatics. So if everybody talking about Asiatics is white and Hebrews claiming to be Afro-Asiatic is basically talking about, is basically the modern day African-American. I heard a brother in the comedic stock tell me, brother, if you call yourself a half or Asiatic, what difference is there from calling yourself African-American? You definitely, you damn near saying you African and European because Asiatics wasn't no black people. I got to ask that brother a question. Have you ever looked at the way Asiatics painted themselves or better yet, the way others painted Asiatics? Because even if you don't believe the painting I wish to show you of myself because you believe I might be lying, I may want to show you six packs where I have none then it stands the reason you might want to believe an eyewitness, which Kemet is. And here, we see that they drew them. Let's take it a step further, because we read the middle letter, right? All right, I'm going to pause it right there for a second. So his point right here is that there are people out there um, that claim, that, that he's saying, that claim that the Asiatics were white or European. Um, I'm not so familiar with people going around saying that, but he's, he's heard that before. And that's something that we don't uh, support uh, and whatnot. But nevertheless, this is what he's saying. Other people are saying. And and what he's offering is this this depiction here. Um, but he said that this is from the Metropolitan Museum, uh, you know, of a, some kind of artifact. So what I want to point out is that first this is. What we're looking at on the screen, this is now this is from their video. This is not something that I put up. What I'm playing is is a direct um, clip from their video. So this is the uh, this is what uh, he is showing. But this is a reproduction. This is not the actual artifact. So although I just want to point that out to be to be very clear and, and um, precise. So the brother is not um, correct when. He's saying that that oh, this may have come from a Metropolitan Museum, but this is a reproduction, a drawing. OK, a reproduction. So what I'm going to do uh, very quickly, I'm going to show you the actual. Um, the actual scene from the actual uh, tomb, mind you, this is from tomb number three in a location called Beni Hassan. All right. This is the tomb of Kanum Hotep. All right. Keep that in mind. This is from a tomb. They didn't move the whole tomb into the Metropolitan Museum. All right. So this right here is a reproduction uh, of it. And I'm just going to show you how the uh, depictions inside the actual tomb looks compared to this reproduction. So on my screen now are pictures, actual photographs from the tomb itself. OK, so you can see it's a lot different. Um. Although I understand the point that he's making, I just want to make it clear that what the brother is showing is not the actual primary source. It's an actual reproduction of it. OK, so that's the first thing I just wanted to point out. That's nothing major at all. But that's, you know, if we're going to be in the business of um, quality and accurate information, I just wanted to point that out. All right. So I'm going to go back to the video and we're going to play some more. So let's look at the top row for, for starters. The glyph we see with the legs denotes walking, and it's a determinative for someone coming in. Okay, I'm going to pause it right here. What he's referring to, uh, I'm not sure if you all, can you all see my cursor? T, I can see it in here. Okay, good. So what he's referring to is the first glyph on the right here the walking legs, he says that this is a determinative and he is incorrect. This glyph right here represents a full word. All right. Is the word any, which means to come at his bare uh, uh, meaning as a verb to come. OK, any to bring or to come. All right. So this is this glyph right here is not functioning as a determinative. In this inscription and mind you this inscription that he's showing is only a partial inscription there's actually more glyphs to the, that will be to the right of this so this is the 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 end of the sentence that he's showing here and again this glyph right here is not 
serving the purpose or the role of a determinative. So that is incorrect. It represents the word any. All right, and we're going to move on. If the legs were faced opposite, it would denote someone leaving, just so you know. And the way that we know the legs are facing in the direction of coming in is because look at the animal, which is the owl, and look at the kneel captive with his hands in fetters or in chains. Look at the direction he's facing. So the direction that he's facing, if you're following me on how to read the Medunetta, that's the direction we begin reading. So whenever the feet is facing in that direction that we begin reading, that means the feet is facing in a direction where it is denoting someone coming in. All right. One thing he is correct about is that, and we always express this, is that you read into the glyphs. So if the glyphs are facing to the right, you're going to read from the right to the left. You're going to re always read into the glyphs as if you're having a conversation with them. All right. But again, that glyph that he's pointing out is not a determinative. Um, it is actually serving as a word. All right. Just want to make sure that's clear. So we're talking about in this scenery of people coming into Kemet. Well, let's take it a step further because we read the Medunetta. Look at the two water glyphs and the viper. This literally means and would be an equivalent in Hebrew to the Hebraic term Iber or Avar, which means to pass by or to come through. And okay, uh, I have to pause it there. The brother is incorrect once again. Um, this first glyph here, the next glyph, the next glyph here is a water ripple and this horn viper uh, is one word. This word is any and F, which means he brought. The F or this horn viper is a uh, third person masculine suffix pronoun for he. And it's past tense, which is this second water ripple, is the, uh, is the grammatical marker for past tense. So this is any and F, which means he brought. He brought. Okay, so we have glyph one, two, three, and four. These four glyphs spell out one word that have grammatical markers or morphemes within it that will tell us that this is past tense, it's a verb, and it's a uh, third person masculine singular with the um, F on the end as a suffix, all right? So again, the brother is incorrect. It has nothing to do with a Hebrew word, um, avar or whatever that he uh, just claimed. So I wanna make sure that's very clear, all right? So let's keep going. The Medunetta Dictionary will show you that these two, that this glyph right here represents coming into a place, a locale. Right behind it, you see the glyph for ah. And below it, with the arm stretch, you see another glyph for ah. They both denote ah. Behind it, to the left of it, is the owl, which represents the letter M again. So, so far we have am, A-M, am. Be next to that, we have the throw stick. The throw stick is used as a determinative in Kemet to represent foreigners. You find it in the words Nahisi, which is one of the more aboriginal terms for Nubia or Kush. And after the throw stick, you find a determinative for a captive. Right behind him, which looks like a horseshoe, you see three glyphs that look like horseshoes each one of them represents the numeral 10. So if there's three of them, there's 30. When you count the other strokes, they literally represent ones. And we see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 37. So this glyph literally says there's the people coming in to Kemet, and the glyph is naming them. It's calling them Amu. Amu. Guess what? This is how we say Asiatics. All right, I'm going to pause it and make some comments about what he just said. So, uh, again, the first set, first four glyphs, uh, the brother was wrong about. And the next glyph is a column that represents a bilateral that represents two consonants. And it's 
spells out ah. This arm glyph underneath of it is a phonetic complement, which is the second um, consonant within this biliteral. And when you learn at a basic level of Sesh Medu um, and by the way, I'm going to let everyone know where they can actually learn and take classes at to learn, um, you know, by way of some have some training and learn. And it won't take two and a half years to learn uh, these basic things. But we have the column that represents the biliteral ah, and then we have the arm that's a phonetic complement for that second consonant. We have the owl, as he said, and the throw stick, and then we have the uh, kneeling uh, captive as two determinatives. Um, this spells out the, the word amu, which is the word that is popularly translated as Asiatic. So amu, you'll find translated as Asiatic, and then uh, the numbers behind here is the number 37. All right, the way the, the ancient Remich drew out their numbers, they uh, wrote them all the way out. Whereas today we would say we would just have three seven, but instead they will have 30 or three tens and then seven ones. And that's what you're looking at. All right. Um, but I wanted to just point out that um, the throw stick, when he mentions uh, Nahisi, and things the throw stick uh the remage had a um one of the things they did when they identified foreigners they would identify them by their weaponry or some cultural uh artifact that was unique enough to make a distinction about um foreigners so for example uh ta nahesi or the nahesi you uh people that were from the south they will call them um Pasejit. Uh, which, uh, or not Pasejet, but uh, Pasej, which would be the bow. And so they would label these people as bow people or people of the bow. And you have uh, the word Taseti, which would be the land of the bow. The word Seti comes from the word Set, which means to pierce, to poke at something. And so that's where you get this arrow, this bow and arrow uh, sense of stabbing something. And so Taseti would be the land of the bow. And Pajet, Pasej, uh, is also a word uh, for a weapon, but it also became a word for foreigners because um, the foreigners were seen as violent people, all right, and people that were not um, uh, disciplined within the Remage customs. And so they saw th these people as different and foreigners. Uh, some people may describe them as barbarians and so on and so forth, all right? So just keep all of that um, in mind. So we're going to keep going. In the comedic tongue. But let's take it a step further because there's an occupation so synonymous with Asiatics that it's also the same word for Asiatic. Because if I want to say shepherds in the comedic tongue, there's a number of ways to say it, one of which is also Amu. Amu denotes Asiatics as well as shepherds, but more importantly, Asiatic shepherds. Asiatic shepherds coming into Kemet and right after their name, we see them coming in as what? Captives. I have a question. It's, a, it's, it's just a question. It's getting hot in here. All these people talking about Asiatics came into Kemet. And, you know, we treated them right. And, they, you know, we extended them our fruit and bread basket. And then they took over Kemet beguiled us and murdered us that's not what you painted here you painted here that the asiatics came in as captives let me stop there i want to repeat what he just said he said that you and you meaning the egyptians the egyptians painted the asiatics coming in as captives now the brother is just absolutely wrong about that because i'm going to show you this whole scene okay like I said, this is a reproduction of just a portion of a scene. This is just a, a little small reproduction. But let me show you all the um, full picture again so you can see for yourself um, what is actually being depicted here. All right, so now this may be a little blurry on because of the YouTube but you all let me know if you can see it. Can you see that? Two. 
All right, so um, hopefully you all can see my cursor. Now, if you if you can see my cursor, and I hope you can, I am pointing to that row, that that row of people that in his video he's only showing a very small portion of. So if you notice, there is a, an Egyptian, and now mind you, the Egyptians refer to themselves as Remich. All right, so sometimes I will interchange both words because people may not be familiar with that. Um, but we have a uh, Remich person here and another one here. So we have two. And then after that, we have people who are part of the party of people called the Amu. All right. So if you notice that none of these people are tied, none of these people are captives. They're not tied. They're not captives whatsoever. As a matter of fact, let me let me show a very clear. Um, I'm going to show a reproduction of the whole scene and it's going to be uh, clearer. So give me one second. All right, so I'm going to let me see if I can blow this up here. Okay, so now this is a reproduction of the scene taken directly from the tomb. All right, but this is some somebody's reproduction of it. All right, and what I want to point out is, uh, let me see if I can get it bigger. Uh, a little bit bigger than that. Okay, so let me scroll down a bit. All right, so it... That may be too big. Bring it down a little bit. All right. So hopefully you all can see that. So you all should be able to see my cursor. Now here where my cursor is, is that same line, the same scene. So the first two gentlemen are Remich. They would, they are Egyptians and they're leading the procession. They're leading the procession to someone. This person, this large figure here on the right hand side is Kanum Hotep. All right. His name is outside of the, um, the crop picture. But to the right of him, you, you will see his name there. But that's Kanum Hotep. And so these other two Egyptians here, or Remich, are leading this procession and bringing these people to him. Why? Because they're paying, they're bringing something to them. They're giving a tribute to Kanum Hotep. They're paying tribute. They're actually bringing products to Kanum Hotep. The word that I showed earlier, the word any, which means to bring, is also the word that um, becomes inu, which means production or produce, something that is that is brought some products. All right. And the reason why the word to bring has become um, also the word for products is because it's a word that is used for a lot of, of different expeditions. And when people bring uh, different products in trading. So it's a word that's used that's heavily used in trading documents. If you ever look at um, any of the uh, session or uh, Rodney Kimmel literature and dealing with expeditions, trading, homage, people paying homage and bringing uh, items from different um, areas in Africa and abroad, you'll see the word any and inu used in those in that context a lot. All right. But what I'm pointing out here right now is that this row, nobody is a captive here. They're walking. They have the animals. They're bringing um, items in their arms and so on and so forth. All right. So, again, the brother Zion Lex is wrong. All right. So we're going to continue. That's what this scenery is showing you. This scenery is showing you Asiatics coming into Kemet as captives. Now he reiterated. He says this scene is showing you that that the Asiatics is coming into Kemet as captives. So let's slow it down a little bit and I'm going to show it again. This is the scene. No one in this scene is a captive. No one. All right. Matter of fact, let me blow it up just a little bit. Because on my screen it's showing big, but um, I can see. All right, so hopefully you all can see a little better. All right, 
So where my cursor is, I'm showing these people here. None of these people are captives. I repeat, the scene that he says that the Egyptians drew, he says that they're showing them coming into Ke Kemet as captives. They are not captives at all. All right. So I'm not quite sure why or where he would say that. All right. But it's definitely plain as day that they are not captives. All right. So let's go. Let's keep going. This goes against the narrative of all the Afrocentric teachers. And below it is Asiatics functioning in Kemet. But it, let's take it a step further because there's a name there. Let's read the name. Um, just, just as a side note, even if this was a scene of captives, as he believes, and he's incorrect, um, why would the Egyptians allow captives to carry a weapon? If you look at this first figure next to this um, ibex animal, this this um, horned animal, um, he has a throw stick in his hand. And notice that the throw stick is used as a determinative for these people, the Amu. OK, he has a throw stick, which is a weapon in his hand. Why in the world? Would captives be allowed to carry and hold their weapons freely, untied, unchained, with animals? All right. So I just want to make that clear. Um, are y'all still with me? Because you know I can't see the panel. I'll make sure I'm not talking to myself. Do you read it? Okay. All right. Just making sure. And we're still good on, on YouTube. Uh, by the way, I, I really appreciate if anyone's tuned in on YouTube. I can't see right now, but we will get to uh, the comments afterwards. All right. But I'm going to slow walk this because I'm only going to deal with uh, a couple of claims. Like I said, we, we can revisit the video and talk about some more of the claims. But I'm going to I want to be um, clear as possible. All right. OK, so let's, let's just keep going. So now he's moving on to uh, the name. And we're going to get to that. So here we go. Look at the crook. C-R-O-O-K. -O -O crook. The crook. That gives you the sound heck in the comedic tongue. H-K or H-Q. Heck. To the left of it, what looks like a, um, a triangle, you find the Q symbol. That's a Q symbol. And it's called a phonetic complement because it doesn't really need to be there because the shepherd's crook already gives you the phonetics HQ or heck. But when it has another symbol with a similar phonetic, it's called a phonetic complement. So together, this is heck. And the determinative there is kaso kashu. So this literally is hekasut or hexut or hiksos. How did the hiksos come into Kemet? Instead of being subjective and building a narrative that we want to say, Let's look at what the people of Kemet say. The, Kemet, the people of Kemet have a scenery in Kemet, which shows you Hyksos coming into Kemet. And they're showing you them walking into Kemet, as you can see the determinative for a people walking in. Then it begins to describe these people by the name Amu, which means Asiatics. And then it shows you that these Asiatics are coming in how? On their knees, with their hands behind their back in ropes. OK, so once again, he makes that claim. He keeps making the claim. And it's obvious that the brother Zion Lex did not do any due diligence, did not do any uh, investigation of this scene. Um, I did not even mention where he, that he even mentioned where this scene is from. And so this is something that we teach around here. See, those of us who actually study Kemet, who actually study the language and the culture, we apply rigor and we investigate thoroughly. So we are, um, use the best approach, which is Tep Hesab, the proper method and best method. So we go for the primary sources, if at all possible. We seek it out and we uh, collect the primary sources. We find out where these artifacts are from, where these scenes are from, where this text is from, so on and so forth. And we read directly from it or facsimiles of it. And so, again, this is from the tomb of Kanum Hotep in the uh, location that they refer to as Beni Hassan. And this is from tomb number three, I believe. 
All right. There's different tombs within the same location side by side. And so you have tomb one, two and three. I believe this is from tomb three. And I showed the whole scene. All right. I showed the actual primary, a picture of the tomb itself, um, which is not very clear, but then a reproduction of it. So what you're seeing on the screen now is only a, a very small cropped portion and it's reproduced. This is some this is what somebody redrew and painted. OK, um, so in order to get context of what's going on, you have it's like it's like taking a picture of a paragraph written in English, but you're only cropping out a couple of words and then make it come to a conclusion on it. You can't do that. You have to look at the whole paragraph or the whole page to get as much context as you can. And so this is uh, the work that has to be done in order to make that happen. You have to apply some time to this. You can't microwave this. All right. And so this is why I suggest to the brother at the beginning that he sits under the wings of somebody that will teach him and guide him instead of trying to learn on his own and taking two and a half years and still making um, basic mistakes such as the ones that we're pointing out. All right. So um, again, you know, he said that they're, that they're coming in on their knees and hands tied, but I just showed you the scene. I'm not going to show it again. I showed you that that's just not true. All right. Um, now, to make a comment about uh, the word um, that he is pointing out, uh, the the crook itself is um, now that is a crook. It's a shepherd's crook. And it is for the word heka, which means uh, rulership, to rule something. And it is used to um, basically take control of something. And by extension, the semantic extension is to rule. All right. And it's, it's a, a word that's used for somebody's in charge. And so we have the hill glyph here, which represents the Q, as the brother did say, it represents the Q, which is a phonetic complement um, within this word. The three hills or the triple hills is the word chaset, which means uh, at its bare core meaning, it's a, it's a word that means high place. It's a combination, it's an old fossilized uh, uh, combo of two words, cha, which means to be up high, and set, which is a, the word for place. And so together it became fossilized as one word, chaset, which means high place. And by extension, it means hill, because hills are high, high places. And because Kemet has a natural border on the left and right side of itself, um, on the east and west borders, is the desert and hills. So you have the western hills and the eastern hills. And, and so the word Kaset, literally meaning hill, became the word for foreign, because everything that was not Egyptian or not um, Nekemet um, came from beyond the hills. So the word originally meant hill. Then it became a word for that which comes be from beyond those hills. And then it became a word for foreigner because that which comes beyond comes from beyond the hills is in foreign territory. So the word means foreign. So together, these two words, Heka Kaset, means foreign ruler. And so below this animal is the name of the foreign ruler, which is this gentleman here in the front. So it's Heka Kaset, foreign ruler, Ipsha. So the person's name is right here, foreign ruler Ipsha. All of these people are not Heka Kasut. These people are, are Amu. And among the Amu, you have one in charge or a person who is ruling, a foreign ruler. Heka Kaset Ipsha. That's what we're looking at here. All right. So I just want to make that clear and correct the brother uh, once again. So I'm going to continue. And it says 37 captives. Is this not an eyewitness to how Asiatics came into Kemet? I'll wait. But let's take it a step further. Below, what does it call these Asiatics? Does it not call them Ixos? You see, until we actually get immersed in the culture and language of the thing that we're looking at, we're going to always be wrong. Or we and I would suggest here that the brother takes his own advice to apply more rigor, more discipline, 
and to get up under somebody's wing so that he can actually learn the culture and not look at it through an Abrahamic lens and trying to research things just to debate and argue. You'll never win with that. All right. So that's my suggestion, because the brother is is um, saying one thing, but doing the opposite. All right. He's not familiar with the culture. He's not familiar with the language. And it's clear to those who do know the culture and do know the language, as I'm pointing out. And I can keep on going, going. But like I said, I'm not going to uh, go into too many of the claims, but I'm going to continue for this one. To always be mishandled with misappropriated information by those who intend on feeding us bullshit. Next. All right. Again, the brother needs to take his own advice because he's actually describing himself. But let's continue. Right. Because now we're going to break it down a little further. Because I've heard Cyrus to and Seti. I've heard Unk from the Amara. Yeah, you sound you sound low again. Uh, can, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you said you heard Seti and um, you stopped at the Unk from Amara squad. All right. I don't... I don't know why Seti and Ark from the Amon Ra squad always talk about why Hebrews want to be stinking ass, dirty shepherds. Everybody know them shepherds are stinking dirty, goddamn goat herders. That's Seti, right? I can't figure out why they, why they would say these things. Now I know the language, and I perfectly understand why they say these things. They don't know the language. I uh, want to pause here and put on record that the brother Zion Lex also does not know the language all right just want to make that crystal clear but let's continue if they knew the language they would know how the cometic people view asiatics simply by looking at the word that they gave named them for asiatics because when we look at the word for asiatic which is amu we're going to look at the root and show you what amu actually means because it's one thing to name a people and it's another thing to name them according to an essential characteristic, which is typically what a name is supposed to be. When I name something, just like the word Kemet means black land, I'm calling it that because the land is fertile. So why did Kemet call us Amu? Let's figure this out right here. Asiatics are called Amu. Amu is the word for Asiatics, and there's two ways to write it. As you can see, I showed you the two different ways you could write it in the Medinetta in the Okay, the two ways he's referring to is is right here. So, uh, can you all still see, see my cursor? Two. All right. So these are the two ways here that he's given. So I'm just, just going to follow along with what he's saying. Column, and it literally means Asiatic. Well, let's look at the root of Amu, which is Am. Well, uh, let me back up a little bit. I want to pause it. Just back it up a little bit. Let's talk about why Hebrews want to be stinking ass dirty shepherds everybody know them shepherds are stinking dirty goddamn goat herders that's seti right i can't figure out why they why they would say these things now i know the language and i perfectly understand why they say these things they don't know the language if they knew the language they would know how the cometic people view asiatics simply by looking at the word that they gave named them for asiatics because when we look at the word for asiatic which is amu Okay, I, I brought it back because I want to say something about the ver the word Asiatic itself. All right, that is a very uh, convoluted word uh, in and of itself. Asia means the Orient or East, Eastern, and so it is a very, very um, vague, general word. A very, very vague and general word, uh, Asiatic. You know, it means the Orient or the East, Asia. You know. So it's not a very, very good word when you're dealing in a scientific setting, when you're trying to be precise and very uh, in your descriptions and things. So um, we would have to tease this word out and trace uh, what is actually meant. So although a lot of Egyptologists will translate Amu as Asiatics, that becomes a problem when we're um, looking in the details of this different literature. But on a, on a general conversation, Asiatic people understand uh, that they're foreigners because as long as you understand that they're foreigners, they're not the remnants themselves, then then that can pass by in in a lot of discussions and conversations. But when we're trying to zoom in 
and talk about these people who are referred to as Amu, we have to be very more, we have to be more descriptive and more careful about that. All right. But just keep in mind, Asiatic is a very broad and generalized term. Okay. But let's just keep going. We're going to look at the root and show you what Amu actually means. Because it's one thing to name a people, and it's another thing to name them according to an essential characteristic, which is typically what a name is supposed to be. When I name something, just like the word Kemet means black land, I'm calling it that because the land is fertile. So why did Kemet call us Amu? Let's figure this out right here. Asiatics are called Amu. Amu is the word for Asiatics, and there's two ways to write it. As you can see, I showed you the two different ways you could write it in the Medinetta in the left column. And it literally means Asiatic. But let's look at the root of Amu, which is Am. Am literally means to instruct, to know, to comprehend, as well as to see. Um, I have to pause it here. The brother is absolutely incorrect. That is not the root of the word Amu that's being translated as Asiatic. That is a completely different word. And to repeat what the brother is trying to tell of others, to direct it to him, had he know, known the culture and if he really knew the language and how the language works, he knows how to, if he knew how the writing system works and he knows the morphology and syntax of the language, which is uh, collectively called grammar, then he would know that these are two totally different words that have nothing to do with each other. The word that he's trying to say is the root of the word Amu. It is not the root of Amu. So he's just outright wrong. And everything he says after that is just outright wrong. So this word here um, is not even the word Amu or Am, as he says. This is Amam. The word is Amam. And it means to instruct, to know, to comprehend, to see. With the determinative of an I, which is uh, dealing with perception and sight and so on and so forth. It's a completely different word. The language and writing system does not work the way that this brother is assuming it does. And if he learned under someone who knows what they're doing, who's competent and proficient in the language, um, then he would know this and it wouldn't take two and a half years to um, to pick up on uh, the correct way of of dealing with the language. But let's continue. Look on the right side. Again, am um means to know and understand. And what I did was I showed you two different ways that the word am um is written in the Medunetta, and they both have the same definition. Okay, now this one on the right is uh, is the word am um or ama, and again. It is not the root of the word Amu. Totally different words. Have nothing to do with each other. In fact, this word Amma is, it mean, this particular um, version of this word that I'm pointing to, hopefully you all can see my cursor. It means to know, to understand, and to perceive. This particular word is associated with the word Am which means to eat. And if you're familiar with the so-called book of the dead in the judgment scene of the book of the dead, of various different books of the dead, which is the Rauniyu Peret and Heru, which is what we should be calling it. Um, the judgment scene, you'll see a, um, a composite animal of a crocodile, a hippopotamus, uh, a lion and so on and so forth. And that, is a feminine deity called Amit or Amamit. And, and people translate that word as the devourer because she, as a monster, is waiting to devour your heart if you're not, if you don't pass the judgment. And so this word Amamit, her name as a devourer or the monster means to eat, to devour. So this word on the screen, ama, means to know, to understand, or perceive because it, it relates semantically to the fact that when you learn something, you are ingesting and digesting information. And so they're related to each other in that sense. 
All right. So this is why those words are associated. But again, none of this has to do with the word Amu that's being translated as Asiatics. All right. Again, if the brother were to um, study under a competent teacher, proficient teacher, then uh, these mistakes like this would not uh, occur. So again, I go back to my suggestion to the brother. All right, but let's keep going. To know, understand, and perceive. To instruct, to know, and comprehend. The root of amu is am. And if you learn anything from what I said earlier, the u sound pluralizes words as a suffix in the Meduneta. So amu is a group of people. So amu, the u, means we're talking about a group, plurality, a group of people, a nation. But the root would obviously be am. Shepherds and Asiatics are called Amu not because they're dirty and stink, but because of their deep and profound wisdom as nomadic people. All right. So this is a uh, wishful thinking on the brother's part to to think that the Egyptians or the Remich saw these nomadic pastoralists, these people that that wandered around. All right. Um, and were non sedentary people for the for the Remich to see them as wise and knowledgeable people that's wishful thinking on the brother's part and i'm going to show that in a few seconds what the egyptians how the egyptians actually looked at these people as but let's continue we always hear about the the biggest pitfall of asiatics and hebrews or nomads in a whole is that they had no land these dirty stinking shepherds they didn't even have no lands they roamed the earth with shepherds with sheep and goats yeah let me tell you something about experience and trade. Two things occur when people are traveling the world and trading as they travel. In trade, we trade merchandise and goods as well as ideas. If you stay in a locale and you look around the scenery of that locale and you begin to develop high wisdom like the people of Kemet did based on what they saw in their vicinity, Surely they're going to have some profound and deep things to say about what they could see. What about the person that traveled the whole world, saw more, and traded ideas as well as merchandise with everybody they met? What would you say about the intellect of those people? I'm not going to leave it for you to say. I'll tell you what the people of Kemet said. They said that they were instructors. They had knowledge. They had comprehension. They were visionists. The word see. They had knowledge and understanding and perception. All right. Again, the brother is absolutely wrong. And that's wishful thinking on his part. And I understand, you know, why he would make, uh, uh, you know, such a lofty claim about um, those people, because he's himself. I believe he's a, a Hebrew or attached to Abrahamic uh, belief system. All right. But the Egyptians did not see them that way. All right. As we'll see in, in, a, in a second. I'm going to see what he says after this and then I'll show you. That is how the people of Kemet viewed the Amu. Hence why. We just saw the glyph for Hyksos was the shepherd's crook, right? What is the symbol or symbol or emblem of kingship in Kemet? Is it not a shepherd's crook? I want you to think for a second, people. If the shepherds are so dirty and so stink and so dumb, why is a shepherd's crook the symbol of kingship in Kemet? I'll wait. All right, he doesn't have to wait um, because we have the answers. The shepherd's crook is representing a word, heka. The word heka means ruler. It's just that simple. And so if the brother actually learned the language and knows how the writing system works, that um, the glyphs themselves are pictographs, but they don't function for what the pictures, um, what the glyphs are depicting. And if the brother would study the rebus or rebus principle, he would understand this, that the picture has nothing to do with what the sound or the phonetic, uh, the phonology of the word. Um, and we, we give a famous, uh, a famous rebus example that everyone uses is the word I believe. If you, have a, if you draw a picture of an eye, an eyeball, a human eye, and then you draw a picture of an insect, the bee, and then you draw a picture of a leaf, a leaf that falls from a tree. You have those three pictures in front of you. You're actually looking at a rebus of the phrase, I believe. But notice that 
to believe something has nothing to do with a human eye, a insect of a bee or a leaf. So so pictures are are used and this is a, a genius invention of the Nile Valley inhabitants because this is the this is the invention of a writing system is when you take something visual and it and you map it to sounds in your particular language. We explain all of this in our book has the uh, Egyptian writing system been deciphered a rebuttal to Walter Williams. So if you want more information about that pick up the book because we go into uh, a lot of detail about that that I'm not going to go into tonight. But again, the brother is wrong about that. But let's uh, continue to see what he says. Fly. In fact, the word for king is is used with a sedge plant and a bee. So we have Nisud Biti is the word for king. All right, there's several different words for um for ruler and things like that. The uh, shepherd's crook is held in the hands of uh, a ruler, just like the staff is in in the ha held in the hands of the emira or overseers of different agencies and um, uh, jobs and things like that. All right. So just keep all that in mind. All right. So now he's going to move on to something else. So so he's, he's going to talk about the word Israel. So I'm going to end his video there. And so let me cut over to uh, further explain uh, why he's incorrect and just show you some information um, in support of that. All right. So bear with me one second. Let me get back to it. Um, OK, so again, here is the here is one of the scenes from the tomb. All right. This is the actual picture from the tomb itself. All right. You see that that the colors are still there. Original colors are still there. There's a lot of damage there. Um, but this is a, a big scene. So the, the shot is kind of far away. You can't really pick up on the glyphs. And I zoom in, it's going to uh, blur up a little bit. All right. But I just wanted to show that. Now, here is a reproduction of the scene that he showed. This is another reproduction. All right. By someone else. Now, this reproduction shows the shows more of the scene because because where he showed it cut off right here. Remember, he started with the with the legs and the new bowl above it. All right. Um, but this is the full sentence. So he wasn't working with a full sentence. All right. Uh, but I just want to show the scene. So we have two remage there. Um, we have one that is actually handing um, a document to Kanum Hotep, who was outside of this picture to the right. You can't see him in this in this particular picture. All right. But we're going to go go through this real quick. And here's another um, another comparison to the actual tomb itself. This is a picture of a crop portion of the tomb itself and then the reproduction. So you see the word um, Heka Chaset and Heka Chaset here, which is in the circled in red. All right. Just showing that. Here's another picture of the scene. OK, these are actual uh, photographs of the tomb itself. And here is another uh, rendition, another reproduction by even someone else. OK, this one is numbered. OK, the reason why it's numbered is because we did a previous video translating this for everyone. So you can look in our archives and you can see um, the translation and transliteration of this. But I'm going to go through it very quickly here. So we have line one. We have two, this section here of glyphs, three, which is this section, and then four, this section here. All right. So. In our presentation, we went over how how to actually go through and transliterate and translate and how you use the sign list and how you use the dictionary. So this is just an example of what we went through in our previous video. So I'm not going to go through all of this uh, tonight. You can check the archives to see the full video. But our transliteration uh, from line one to section two, three and four. OK, now notice um, I had to switch back and forth. So in line one. Here, um, you should be able to see, um, you see where he um, cut off, you know, he, in his picture, it was cut off. He didn't have the uh, entire uh, inscription there. But the inscription reads in line one, we have yet, which is a word um, coming. Like when we, when we start off our show, you hear me say ETM Hotep. That word E means to welcome or to come. E-T-M-Hotep, e e e which means welcome in peace. 
Imhotep in peace. Okay, so this is the same word that you're looking at. Yit, but it's with the feminine ending, yet. And then we have her, yet her, and then the word inet. That's the same word that he started off with, but it's later on in the sentence. You'll see. You see the legs and the new bowl above it. So we have yet her inet. And then uh mes jemut. And then we have the word uh in and f. And then amu 37. Okay, and what that is saying is yet is the word coming, and then her means to be upon or on something. And together as a phrase, when you when you uh, have the phrase her inet, it means coming or together, it means coming on the account of something. And what is the account of? Uh, inet, bringing. So coming on the account of bringing mesjimet uh, or mesjimut, which is I paint. That word mesjimut uh, is I, the word for I paint. And that was imported into Kemet uh, or brought by uh, foreigners into Kemet um, on several occasions. And this is one of those occasions. And it was brought, uh, then it goes on to say, uh, any NF, which is uh, brought by him or, or he brought. And then we have the word Amu and 37. So we have 37 Amu or individuals or people within that caravan. The picture doesn't show all 37 people, but that's what the statement is saying. All right. So I just wanted to make that um, clear of what you all are looking at, actually looking at. OK, so that's the full sentence. It's not talking about prisoners. No one is tied up. These people even actually have throw sticks in their hand, some spears and everything. So why? <laughs> why would captives still not be bound, not be tied up? And still be allowed to have animals and weapons. And, and then the remage got their back turned to them. So that doesn't even make sense on face value. And this is the rest of the caravan. You got a donkey. You got some children uh, there. Even even the young the young lad got has a spear in his in his uh, hand. Even the donkey is carrying spears. Uh, someone's carrying a bow and a throw stick, you know. So that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. All right. But I don't want to dwell on this uh, too, too much. All right. So I'm going to keep on going uh, here. Now, I want to get to um, I want to get to the point where he was saying that uh, the root of Amu, which is being translated as Asiatic, is the word for wisdom and instructions and to know and to perceive and things like that which I said is absolutely not the same word is totally different words. It's not the root of the word at all, but let's see where he got it from. So if you go to um, EA Wallace Budge dictionary of Egyptian hieroglyphic um, on page 121 B, you'll see where he got the word um, where he got his word uh, Amam, which means to perceive, to understand, to comprehend, to see, to know. All right. And if you see these glyphs here, this is the exact same thing he has on this um, page here. He's saying it's the root word. All right. Now, he made that up because Budge doesn't say it. So he feels that he's comfortable enough in his skills in the language to come up with that on his own. But he's absolutely wrong. All right. Again, this is a totally different word. All right. And the word is a mam. It's not am as he said. It's a mam. All right. Because I'm going to let you know why. This sickle here is a biliteral for the word ma. And it's actually a sickle of the word, uh, the glyph that's also used in the word for ma'at as well. You'll see ma'at spelled with that same sickle. All right. So you have ma'a and then you have another owl here. Ma'am. Okay. So we have a, which is the arm, and then ma'a, m. Amam, all together, amam, all right? That's what it means, to perceive, to know, to understand, etc. cetera, all right? Um, now, the word am here, which is another word that he has on his, on his page, which is over here to the right, which is to know, to understand, and perceive, also from Budge, but this is from page 111, column B. 
the B now mind you when we whenever you see uh um teachers or or scholars give references to budge you'll see that that it, you'll have budge name the page number and then the column or you'll see a letter a or b that means the column a or b left or right because budge dictionary is in two column two column format all right just so you all, you all will know that so we have page uh 111 b and we have amam so it means to eat notice he didn't he didn't include that on there now m mind you these are the same glyphs one two three four five six glyphs and let's go back to this page one two three four five six glyphs okay same thing but he didn't include to eat let's go back to this page do you see do you see do you, any y'all see to eat on there no uh. okay uh so i don't know if he conveniently left that off to drive his point home or or what but it means to eat to understand to perceive so what i said earlier is that the word to understand and the word to eat has a semantic relationship because when you're taught something or learning something, you're ingesting knowledge or information. And so it has this connotation or this, this sharing overlap of the semantics. All right. Just so you all know um, that what I was not making this up. So, again, it, it also means to eat. And it goes into the word, as I said, Amamut, which is a uh, composite deity that's uh, that's described as a monster who waits at the judgment scene to devour the heart of those who do not pass the test of judgment. All right. And she's called the devourer, which means the eater. And and together, matter of fact, this word here, this is why I have this here on on Budge, page 37, column B. We have another word here. We have the word uh, amib. The word amib, it means, uh, literally, it means eater or to eat the heart. That's what it literally means, to eat the heart. But it is used as an idiom in the language for those who study the language, who actually study the language, who actually know the culture of Kemet and so on and so forth, who actually read the literature will understand this to be an idiom because you'll find it in, in uh, de several different inscriptions. It's an idiom that simply means guilt because am-ib means to eat at your mind. The word ib is the word for the mind and it is the mind that's being weighed on the judgment scales, not your heart, actual heart, your literal heart, literal heart. It's the content of your mind that's being weighed against a straight and narrow structure that we refer to as ma'at. So uh, am ib means the eater of the mind. And what eats away at your mind is if you do wrong and you know you do, you're doing wrong. What do we call that today? We call that guilt or guilty conscious. And it eats away at you. And so to this very day, we still use this kind of expression. Obviously, we don't we don't say it in the same way, but the same meaning is is behind it. Guilt. So amib is the word for guilt. Literally, it will be eating away of, of the heart or the mind. OK, so I want to point that out. And, you know, it, again, if the brother was actually learning the language from a competent teacher, uh, someone who's proficient in language, he wouldn't make such um, basic mistakes. All right. So lastly, what I want to show is a recommendation. It's actually a recommendation when it comes to the amu. Um, I recommend those who, who are interested in learning about the Amu and the scholarship around it to pick up this book. It's called Asiatics in Middle Kingdom Egypt, Perceptions and Reality by Phyllis Sareta or Sareta. OK, it's available on Amazon. I believe it's like thirty nine dollars for the paperback or whatever the case is. I have nothing to do with the book, so I'm not trying to, um, you know, advertise for it. It's just my recommendation. Because in this particular, it was written in 2016, so two years, two years ago. So it's fairly recent. And in the book, what she does is that she goes through the previous scholarship. So she does a, uh, she has a section on literature review and, and discuss what scholars have said about the word Amu and its problems and um, and its solutions on how to approach the word and everything. So she does an in-depth study of the word Amu and and um, the Asiatics 
uh, in Middle Kingdom of, of Kemet or Egypt. All right. It's a good book to get so that you can be up to date on the scholarship. Um, whenever I recommend books, I don't recommend them um, as a final say so because I tell people to do their due diligence. It, just because you have a PhD or a doctor after your name doesn't mean that you're infallible. So always uh, keep up the, um, the investigation. But this is a, rec a recommended um, book that I uh, book that I would recommend about it. All right. And so this is now this is what real students do. They apply rigor and they do literature review to find out what the scholarship is saying about the particular subject. You don't have to agree with them, but you have to know what is being said pro or for or against. And then you can weigh and then you do your own research or you come up with your own discoveries and your own ideas and add it in. And then you could you could falsify other people's claims or you can show a superior methodology to um, supersede someone else's claims as well. That's how you do scholarship. All right. So I want to take a moment real quick to um, read from this particular book just to show you the content. Now, lo and behold. Within the book, they have the word Amu. She has the word Amu. And look at the title. The etymology, usage, and synonyms of the word Amu. And so I'm not going to read this, but I just want to show you that the scholarship is done on this particular topic. So it's best, and this is why we do literature review, so you can become be abreast on the scholarship of whatever particular topic you're dealing with so you'll be caught up to date on what's what's uh what's being said about it the latest data and anything that you discover you can add on to the body of knowledge that's how scholarship is done all right so this particular book actually addresses the etymology the usage and the synonyms for the word amu now this uh i'm not going to read the whole thing but it, there are a couple of things i want to point out so let me uh skip over to it give me a moment to find my cursor uh where we at where we at where we at okay here we are okay so um all right so let me skip through and again i recommend people to get it because you know i, I won't do it any justice by skipping through it but it's it is one thing that i want to point out and let me find it real quick i'm skipping through the pages OK, so here she says that the term Amu, so the etymologies of the vocable Amu, all right, run the gamut from ingenious to fantastic. No one of them inspiring more confidence than the other. The two major explanations are that the word has either a native Egyptian origin or else that it is a West Semitic loan word. All right. Those are the two prevailing schools of thought or, or thoughts about this particular word. All right. And so she says Muller and has a footnote. You can um, see where Muller is saying this, but this is another scholar. Muller later followed by Thompson, two scholars, explained Amu, translated as Asiatic in the Egyptian text as a term deriving from the Egyptian Amu, which means boomerang or throw stick. He, cl he came to this conclusion based on the use of a throw stick determinative in Egyptian writing of Amu and also the basis of homophony. I'm going to go back to that in a second. He postulated that the term Amu is to be equated with boomerang throwers and that in later texts, the boomerang sign is extended to designate barbarians of various sorts. For example, the boomerang plus the M is Amu. The boomerang plus the S is Nahis, the Negro. The boomerang and the Nu is the Chahinu or the Libyans. It is true that the Egyptians identified other foreigners according to their weapons. For example, Pajeti, which is the number nine. And it's the word uh, Pajeti nine, which would be the nine bows. And if anyone's familiar with the culture, they know that Kemet had a generalization of enemies as uh, the number nine. The nine bows were the nine known enemies to Kemet. And those nine members of that uh, um, group of enemies changed but it always remained nine to the point where some of the kings even had the word pajeti and what it represent in the glyphs on the bottom of their sandals 
so that they so that it implied that they walked over their enemies. All right. So Pajeti nine is the word for nine bows. Idris traditional enemies or bowmen. Redford was another scholar. However, correctly points out that the presence of the throw stick determinative with Amu can be more easily explained as the observation of a cultural characteristic and not through a linguistic relationship or homophony. All right. Um, that's one thing I want to point out. So I'm going to skip and I want to go to this section here. This section is speaking about the usage of the term in context in Egyptian text with the word chesi. The wretched Asiatic. Now, people may be familiar with the word chesi when it when it comes to uh, uh, the wretched Kushites. OK, uh, the word the word chesi, chesi is used in relation to Kushites, the wretched Kushites. There's even books that's called wretched Kushites. But people may not be familiar with that. The Asiatics were called wretched as well. So how did the Egyptians look at the Asiatics? All right. So let's look at it. It says the epithet. Chesi first appears in conjunction with the term Amu in the instructions of Meri Kare or Meri Kara. Okay, so I, I implore everyone to look up the instructions of Meri Kara. All right, that's one of the Sabait uh, instruction. You have the instructions of Patahotep, the instructions of Amenope, and so on and so forth. Uh, Meri Kara is another set of instructions. Okay, so it's very valuable information. But in there, you'll find uh, these two terms used together. The term has generally been translated at, in the literature as wretched or miserable. And to quote the section, it says, Behold, the miserable Asiatic, difficult is the place where he is. The term has a variety of nuances ranging from weak, feeble, vile, wretched, and cowardice to ritual impurity. But as Lorton points out, another scholar, there is ambiguity in the term Kesi in the context of Medikara. It could mean suffering from misery or wretchedness, describing the hardships of the lifestyle of the Asiatics. In this sense, the term would be used as a neutral description rather than a hostile castigation. Uh, the civilized Egyptians perceiving the lifestyle as barbaric and thus looked upon them with disdain. The Egyptians point of view towards the Amu derives from the perception of the hopeless situation of these people, the Egyptians were being affronted by something distasteful and the Asiatics being judged by their condition. They wander around and lived in abject poverty. They are professional losers. The Egyptians were settled farmers and there are always these cultural gaps between sedentary people and nomads okay i just want to point that out again i implore everyone to get this book um or whatever you have to do to get it and read it and check it out all right not as a final decision but as part of your um research read it all right um now i don't want to take too much time but but we can go into the actual primary um text of medicara and see the context around that statement and to save time, just to let you know, um, the the uh, the Remage saw the um, the nomadic pastoralist, the nomadic lifestyle as something that was distasteful because remember, they were farmers and they were set settled along the river. And because of the settled uh, the settled um, lifestyle along a river, they had more time to contemplate other things than survival and people who have to wander and follow animals everywhere they go. Because once you have a surplus of food by way of farming, then it actually frees up some time. And over time, the collection, the, the collective community can start to ponder different things. And this is why one of the reasons why the ancient remage advanced in knowledge, because they actually bought themselves some time. By becoming farmers and storing food with the help of the Nile. They were blessed by the Nile. All right. So that's all I have for now. And I don't like I said, I don't want to go too long. I, I went longer because I wanted to um, make sure I was clear with um, the things that I was uh, saying uh, tonight. But uh, in conclusion, I just want to say this again, 
that matter of fact that this is a picture of the book again um for those to get the book it's available on amazon um when it comes to the question about the amu um but i want to say that the brother uh zion lex um now i don't I, I don't watch a lot of uh a lot of what you know i don't i don't i don't deal with the drama and and the showboating and stuff like that you know i don't you know i don't i just don't deal with it it's not my cup of tea um, I pay attention to the claims and, and if they're accurate or not, whatever the case is. And um, I did see an, a, another video a while back when he debated the brother Jabari and he made some claims about the um, Book of the Dead. And he was insinuating that the laws of Ma'at were written somewhere and that the Egyptians inherited them. Inherited them. He's implying that they inherited them from Sumer or somewhere in Mesopotamia. That because his logic is that in order for you to say, I have not done something, then at some point in time prior to that, you were told that not to do something and it was written. And then he, you know, attempts to cite Dr. Ben and so on and so forth. And I noticed that the brother tries to use scholars against each other or or against whoever he's debating. Like Dr. Ben said this, but you're saying that or Ashra Kwesi says this or whatever. You know, see, you know, in in real scholarship, we you don't appeal to authority everybody is is uh susceptible to error all right um we give respect where respect is due and and uh people who are accurate are accurate but people make mistakes you know all the time so arguing from from um you know from authority or arguing for authority is is a logical fallacy that we stay away from anyway um but so, again, I just want to uh, say that the brother needs to um, should take some time out to actually learn the language. I'm all for autodidacts, you know, um, you know, I'm all for that. But that is that should be like a last resort. That should be a um, ne necessity way of learning, not you, you jump out the gate and be that way. But I understand in the in this social community that we're calling the conscious community, the egos are so high that people feel like they can't learn up under their fellow brother or fellow sister so they want to learn on their own and then come back and have the aha moments like see you know i told you and then be able to debate and so on and so forth you know later for that we don't have time for that there's so much to learn and so much more information we can add on to the body of knowledge that we do know that we don't have time for that really so i don't engage in that you know so um Anyway, so, you know, I'll, I'll just conclude there. The brother needs to step step it up. And, um, you know, I really don't know why he's even traveling in this lane if he's not going to travel right. You know, um, he should fall under the wings of somebody to teach him properly uh, because he makes several mistakes. And I only went over these because of time. But there's several more. I mean, the entire video, he's making he's making mistakes. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wanted to cover something um, um, outside of what I just covered. Um, yeah, that was, um, that was really good. I watched the video. I didn't watch the whole, um, the whole video cause it was, um, three, hours. I think it's about three hours long, but, um, I just watched a little bit. And from, from the beginning, there was a, the, I think there was two things that, uh, we could go over that were just, uh, pretty basic stuff that, um, I think would be good for people to know. And these are like basic stuff that for somebody who studied the language, like for two and a half years, they should not be making these kind of mistakes so i just wanted to point those out as well okay well let's go but before you do let's just um are there any comments because like i said while while i'm sharing my screen and everything i can't see the chat um and things that i don't want to um Man, no comments. yeah we had a comment earlier um i didn't want to stop your flow but since we want to be clear uh, it came up when we were talking about the determinatives and their position in the word. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I've seen uh, where we have the determinative in the middle of the word. So we we, we don't want uh, people to think that the determinative is only at the end. Okay. There are instances where you can find it in the middle of the word. Okay, that's a very good point. Matter of fact, we point that out in the book, in, our, in the textbook that we use, uh, Beginner's Introduction to Metal Nature. We point that out in the determinative uh, section of the book where uh, the majority of the time, most of the words that do have determinatives. First of all, not every word has a determinative that needs to be understood first. 
And then out of the words that do have determinatives, um, most of them, the determinatives come at the end of the word. And it is by that reason why we can tell where one word ends and another one begins. But there are rare occasions where a determinative is not placed at the end. And this is for what we call graphic transposition, when um, for aesthetic reasons, the scribes would transpose the, the determinative from the end of the word and put it somewhere else to be aesthetically pleasing. OK, so there are some words that are like that. And you have words that have more than one determinative. All right. So don't think that every word just has one determinative. OK, like, for example, the word Amu that we were showing has two determinatives, the throw stick and the um, the kneeling uh, man with his hands tied behind the back. OK, those are two de two determinatives there. But all right. So we, we um, hopefully that's clear. And hopefully I'm clear. So, so I want to take a moment. Were there any, um, were there any questions? Were there any questions? Did y'all see any questions outside of that one? And then just the one June asked, and then um, we got one question by Brother Zane. He asked, "Is the word Asiatic and Amu really paired together?" Okay, that's a good question, and that's what I was alluding to earlier. The word Asiatic is very, very vague and broad. So it's not it's not a good word to use in a scholastic setting. Now, scholars will translate Amu as Asiatic, but it's it, it's not beneficial to do that. OK, so the Amu, what you'll find out is that the, the uh, Remage described their eastern neighbors, northeastern or eastern in general, uh, by different words. So you have um, those who lived in Canaan. You have those who lived in um, Syria, what became what known as Syria, and so on and so forth. And some of these um, were described differently. Some of these people were described differently or you, different words were used for them. And then you have a general word that's used that overlaps them. And so as long as we understand that, we'll, we won't be confused. So the word Amu um, as a Semitic loan word, it would be equivalent to the word Amorite. OK, if you do the history on the Amorites and and their migrations and their movements and things like that, you'll find out that the Amu being described by the um, the Remich are the Amorites. All right. So that's what you'll find out. So, I, again, I suggest people to do uh, further research on, on that. And that, that's right. Uh, Brother Sean says it's too ambiguous. It is. All right. So. um, Oh, and also I see uh, Hekka Netcher. It says, tell them the difference from Hyksos and Amu and if those descriptions overlap. OK, the word Hyksos is the Greek rendition of a phrase. It's not a single word. Now, the way the Greeks rend rendered it is a single word, Hyksos. But it comes from two words, Hekka Chaset. And Hekka Chaset is a phrase that means foreign ruler. That's all it means. It's not an ethnic group. Because, in fact, the um, people south of Kemet, the rulers south of Kemet, were also called Heka Kaset. And you can find that in the autobiography of Winnie or Uni. Remember, I repeat, in the autobiography of Winnie, you'll find that the people south of Kemet were also called not people, but the rulers among those people were also called Heka Kaset, which means foreign rulers. That's all the word, uh, all the, uh, what the word means. OK. So I want to make that clear. Amu are people that you'll be able to identify when you narrow it down, when the smoke clears and the dust settles, you'll find out that they are um, equivalent to the Amorites. All right. So just want to make everybody aware of that. OK, so uh, so um, Sonet, M.E.K., you, you wanted to go over something and then we can uh, let's do that. Um, yeah, we could do that. I will try to share my screen. And hopefully that should be sharing now. Okay, let me make sure everyone else can see it. And 
Okay, so you are up. There you are. All right. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure if you wanted to play the video first, but I did write the um, the timestamps down and uh, pretty much just put the claim in case uh, we don't want to go over there. Okay. Let um, me let me play. What's what's the time? What's the timestamp? I'll just go right to it. So that would be eighteen forty. Eighteen minutes forty seconds. All right. Let's play it right about from there. All right. So I'll play the audio so everyone can hear. Okay. Uh, another thing that they say is that, um, you know, Hebraic culture is misogynistic because in the Kemetic uh, culture and system, um, there is a divine feminine energy as well as a divine masculine energy. What they will not tell you is although a divine feminine, feminine energy exists in the culture, it is never exemplified or i.e. highlighted as much as the masculine is. For instance, we may continue or that was enough. Um, yeah, that that pretty much is enough. Um, so uh, in this um, in this section, um, he's trying to make a claim that um, the you know that the greatest terms for nature in the language always applies to the ma masculine and is never used in the feminine. And it, and in, in in this particular instance, he's using the phrase nature are. So he's saying that never you know it's never found in the feminine, uh, pretty much. And um, this is something that if you've you know been having your head deep in the books and on, on a language for two and a half years, you should have known that. Um, I mean, pretty much um, just looking at the, 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 the deities um, that we have or the nature rules that we have in, 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 in Kemet, we have like, um, we have a, a lot of, uh, of, of the nature rules, about 2000 of them, and they're pretty much balanced. And that, that, that on its own already, uh, the balance between the, fem the, the feminine deities and the masculine deities. And that kind of just kills that. But the, the most important thing is that when you're learning the language, you would actually have met, um, you know, known some of the, the epithets of some of the, 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 the female deities like we have um, Oset um, that has the epithet um, Nature R. We have um, Sekhmet, we have um, Meat and uh, Hato or Het Heru. And um, uh, on the screen, what you're looking at, um, I don't know if you see my cursor, to you we can see it i can see it all right okay good so um i just put three examples of some of the um some of the phrases that you can you know that that we can you know come across um in in different um primaries and uh, in the first instance we have a set in this case is as um a set ta naturet art and um this one actually says a set the great <clears throat> the great divinity and um, this actually um, just kind of speaks on what he's saying that the the word nature are that it does not apply to the feminine and it's never used in the feminine the um, the word of the great divinity. And here we already see that is the case. We see um, in nature are um, the t suffix is added um, to to the root uh, nature, which is nature red, and then the uh, the t suffix is also added to to the adjective we have are. So, which is our art. So, it will still be the great divinity. But in this um, instance, we're talking about um, the feminine aspect of it. And the, uh, the second um, example that we have is um, Jed Medu in Nut Art Heret Ib Hut Heret. And this is word spoken by Nut, the great, who is in the lower house. So, we're already seeing um, another uh, deity, which is um, Nut being referred to as the great which he says that's not and is never used in the feminine the the the, the greatest down for the nature is never used um in a, in a, in, a, in a feminine but we see that being used that and in the first example just to, um, to note that you can find in the temple of isis on philae island and then this other example you can find on the pyramid of um teti and then the last example i have there's pretty much a lot of examples but i'm just giving real quickly um, some of the examples that you can come across real quick. It's not something that you have to kind of spend two, two and a half years looking and not finding. So the, um, this other last example will be Nechiret Art Henet Ta Shemao, which would be the great goddess. And this is talking about Hatha and is in um, the great goddess in Upper Egypt. And this is um, from a ritual offering and hymns on the central hall in Egyptian temples of the Ptolemaic period. So... Um, these are just some of the examples that we see. And, and, and obviously this, you would actually have to know um, grammar as well. So you would know that this, um, you, you can't say something like that, that um, the greatest sound for the nature, the language always applies to the masculine and is never found in the feminine. These are just some of the examples that we, you know, 
that we find. And there's plenty, plenty of those. Like I said, um, the epithets of some of the, the female deities, they have the, the epithet of uh, Neturet Art, which is the great divinity or the great goddess for those who want to use goddess or the great deity. Okay. And then, um, so that was one thing that I kind of noticed real quick on in the very beginning sections of, of that presentation. And then the next slide, um, I think um, that would be if you go to the 40 minute section, it's six minutes long, but we don't have to play. We can play the first two minutes on this one. Okay, you said 40 minutes. All right, let me go forward it up to the 40 minutes and I'll play the audio from it. And that should be it right here, Odyssey. Let me say it again. I want to make this really, really clear. This is a very, very powerful point. Any authoritative Medunetta dictionary has Hebrew words in it. But let me take it a step further. I haven't encountered a Medunetta dictionary yet that doesn't have Hebrew words in it. Why is that? I'll tell you why that is. The early scholars that examined, quantified, and looked at the Medunetta all came to the conclusion that when we talk about grammar and syntax, the Medunetta has a greater relationship to Eastern languages than it does to languages on the continent of Africa. That is a very controversial statement to make, but I'm still going to make it because, again, anyone who says contrary to the statement that I just made first is not privy to what I just said. All right. All right. Um, so, yeah, in that section, he talks about um, the relationship between the um, Eastern languages and, 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 and um, Meru Nature. And uh, um, forward into the video, I think, um, or the presentation, somebody asked for sources uh, for these claims that you make. And um, then he goes on to mention Burge, which I think he kind of uses a lot. And he mentions Burge, and he mentions Burge, um, the, uh, uh, Burge's book, which is the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, Volume 1. And he uses two sources um, to, to build up his case or his claim. And the first source is on page, um, on Volume 1, on page 56. And uh, in this one, he says, um, and we don't have to play that, um, that section, but he says that Hebrew, that um, this is in reference to a quotation, which he says Hebrew is the closest language to the Medu nature. And this is based on the grammar. So he goes on to read um, this section here. Um, this, um, I hope you can see my cursor. To you. Okay. So he goes on to read this section. And he says, the Hebrew, Syriac, Arabic, and other Semitic words quoted in the entries stand in a different relationship to the Egyptian, for they merely represent borrowings of words, usually by the Egyptians from the Semites, while the true Coptic words are native Egyptians. Now he stopped there, but um, what he was reading is, to, is, is in reference to Hebrew being the closest language to the Middle nature. But his reference um, say something different and I, I, you know, he kind of dug at himself on that one. So I don't think he was actually aware of what he was reading because here he clearly states, and this is from Burge, that the Hebrew, Syriac, Arabic, and other Semitic words quoted in the entries stand in a different relationship to the Egyptian. For they merely represent borrowings of words, usually by the Egyptians from the Semites, while the true Coptic words are native Egyptians. So that was the first red flag that he actually probably read this thing and he didn't understand what he was reading, you know, because um, it said the complete opposite of what he was trying to prove. And then um, for the second part of his source, um, he goes to the same book um, on, on a different page. Um, that would be on page 44 in the second paragraph. And he's referencing a claim that the speech revealed to us by the hieroglyphic, hieratic, and demotic texts belong to the Semitic languages. And he can prove this through this reference. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that part that he read. So, um, 
In a very closely written preface, which fills 30 pages, Levi discusses the grammar and the structure of the ancient Egyptian language, which he, tre he treats as though the speech that is revealed to us by the hieroglyphic, hieratic, and demotic text belong to the Semitic family of the languages. So he stops there. So he's trying to say that this, because it, it says this on Baj, that is the truth. So he says, um, but he didn't continue reading it because if he actually read the rest of it, he would understand that it is actually saying the complete opposite. Burge does not agree with him and actually, on the contrary, says otherwise. So he continues to say it was a mistake on his part. So it was a mistake on Levy to actually discuss the grammar and the structure of ancient Egyptian language and treat it as if it was actually, it belonged to a Semitic family with um, you know, a Semitic family of languages. So he says it was a mistake on his part to do this, for he assumed to be a fact that which has never been proved. To him, Egyptian, Coptic, and Hebrew are substantially forms of one and the same language. And then he goes on and on and on. So um, on these two parts, he dug, it, um, he dug it himself. And this actually just shows that um, when it comes to referencing as well, he pretty much didn't actually or does not understand you know, how to reference or how to source because you want to actually reference or source something that agrees with your point, not something that actually counteracts that. So, mm. and that, that's a rookie mistake. Two and a half years, you're studying the language and you, you can't do that. So two things, those were the first two things. And I kind of stopped really much from there um, going forward on the video because th those were my red flags. Um, he didn't understand grammar. He didn't understand how gender works in, um, in, in such metal nature with the, femi with the T suffix. Um, uh, for feminine, feminine endings. And then uh, on this part, he didn't actually, he was using references that completely disagrees with him and acted like they actually proves his point. So those are the two things that I wanted to quickly go over just to show the sloppy scholarship that he produces. So, All right. so, I got a quick question if I can ask. All right. Um, early in the video, because a lot of us, we watched it, nobody else did. Um, he spent a lot of time mentioning grammar, vocabulary, and things of that nature, comparing and contrasting the two. But you just said a minute ago that he didn't display, basically, any understanding of such. Um, no, really, he didn't, um, he didn't really expl uh, explain that. He was talking about uh, his using grammar. And that's another thing you're showing about using grammar. But and, and, and talking about other scholars who use vocabulary to um to to show or demonstrate relationship between um African languages, living African languages like the uh, the, the, the languages within the Bantu um, um family and um and Meru nature. Well, while watching through that, what he was doing was he didn't actually demonstrate anything that was grammar at all. What he did was he picked vocabularies within the grammar and actually did what he actually mocked other uh, or actually said other people are doing, which other people don't do anyway. So that was a logical fallacy anyway. But yeah, so he did that. And um, I just wanted to quickly show that um, I think on the, uh, what you see on the screen, I read this part where he was talking about, um, um, where Bird is actually talking about um, Coptic being native Egyptian. But if for any of those people who are going to continue watching um, uh, Zion Lake's presentation, they're actually going to find that at this, uh, he actually has selective memory because he is going to actually use, um, he's going to use, um, he's going to talk about Coptic not being, not being, you know, being diluted and, 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 and things of the like. And then he's going to actually use, um, let's see, there was a part here that I wanted to emphasize. Yeah. So he, I'll just read this again. He says, um, let me put my cursor on. I'm going to read from here to the, to the end. He says, the Hebrew, Syriac, Arabic, and other Semitic words quoted in the entries stand in a different relationship to the Egyptian, for they merely represent borrowings of words, usually by the Egyptians from the Semites, while the true Coptic words are native Egyptian. They seem to me to stand in quite a different category from the pronouns, which were borrowed at a very early period by the Egyptians from the people whom, for want of a better name we may call Proto-Semites. And the greater number of them were certainly introduced into Egyptian texts after the Egyptians founded colonies in Syria and Palestine by scribes who either knew no Egyptian words 
that were exactly suitable for their purpose or who wish to ornament their compositions by the use of Semitic words or to show their erudition. So over here, uh, Budge actually goes on to state, um, to, um, to mention the fact of um, Egyptians actually using or uh, borrowing some of the Proto-Semite um, words. And, um, and it talks about, um, uh, the, when it talks about the categories from the pronouns. But in the video, um, or in the in the presentation, Lex Luther goes on to actually demonstrate pronouns why he thinks um, uh, Hebrew is related to 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 metal nature using the pronouns. But his reference actually suggests that the pronouns might have been borrowed as well, and he overlooks that. So these are the kind of things that you know when you kind of look at what kind of scholarship somebody's doing, and for that long, you know, it it, it, it is really I mean sloppy is actually. Sloppy is not even the word. <laughs> sloppy is right. kind of like a compliment, really. You know, it's so, extremely sloppy. So listen, that was excellent. Iker, Iker, Eker, Eker. That's um, excellent. Very, um, very straight to the point. So, uh, wow. Let's just summarize real quick because, you know, we are um, pretty long. And, and uh, again, for those who are uh, tuned in watching now in the chat, if you would, um, we're going to end here. But if you would like for us to go over more of the information in these videos or have suggestions of others that we take a look at, by all means, um, go ahead and make the suggestion. Uh, but just to reiterate, I want to underscore what you just shared. OK, so what you just demonstrated. And basically before that, what I was demonstrating is that the brother Zion Lex, his methodology of research or scholarship is sloppy because what you just showed is that he has selective um, uh, review. So he reads a partial uh, text or source text and only goes with what agree what he thinks that agrees with him. But it really doesn't. If he kept reading, like you pointed out, then he would have realized that um that budge actually does not agree with him at all and he budge is the of the opposite opinion of him but yet he utilizes budge heavily and he even emphasizes the fact that early egyptologists uh, when they quantified and described the language they described it as closely related to um to egyptian or to hebrew all right so but that's not what was said OK. And in fact, even today now, Budge, Budge, Budge's work, as incredible as it was and as painstaking um, that it, it took him to to do everything that he's done. Uh, he was a pioneer in his day. But as usual, pioneers are usually overshadowed or corrected later due to um, access to new data, uh, new technology and so on and so forth. So we give pioneers their respect due. But we don't get stuck on them. No one should. And so Budge is considered today by today's standard. Some of his work is outdated. Uh, part in part because new data and new information is known. We have access to a wealth of information that he did not. And in his day and time, no one studied African languages to even compare. Again, and they admit this. In, in, in the new, in my upcoming book on Egyptian grammar, Rani Kemet Grammar, I'm going to point that out in a section how the scholars such as uh, um, Sir Alan Gardner, James Hotch, James P. Allen, and Budge, how they all admit that there's hardly any work, there's scant work that was done in comparing uh, Rani Kemet, which is the indigenous name of the language, or Sesh Metanetra is the writing script or system that we call hieroglyph that people did not do their due diligence in comparing African languages with Rani Kemet or the Egyptian language. And because of that absence, they don't know. But there's African scholars who have and and uh, has done so to this very day, such as Jean-Claude Mboli, uh, Muba Benge Belolo, and uh, Shekhan uh, Dr. Diafalo Benga, and so on and so forth, who have proven without a shadow of a doubt that Rani Kemet is related to Afri other African languages 
through the historical um, comparative method, which is the method for determining genetic relationships between languages, not vocabulary, not chance lookalikes and not borrowings and all that kind of stuff that the brother Zion Lex is talking about. All right. So he's out of his league with that conversation and the conversation he's trying to have about these different things. So we only covered that tonight. And, you know, like I said, we, we definitely went um, over the time that we were trying to um, allow but leave a comment, leave a suggestion if you would like for us to go over any more of, of his video or even other suggestions or whatever or something that you want us to put our eyes on and take a look at, by all means, make the suggestion. All right. But we have to understand that, you know, um, you can't microwave this. All right. Kemet is not something to be uh, played with. A lot of people are playing with it. Um, matter of fact, Brother June said earlier, I don't know, June, June, you still here? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you had made a comment earlier about uh, Kemet being the um, the new go-to or something. Can you, can you re uh, kind of repeat what you were saying? That was interesting. Oh no, it just seemed like it's a it's like a go-to hustle. <clears throat> a lot of people, um, a lot of people just I don't know. It seemed like they're attention seekers, and and right now it's Kemet's like the cash cow. Like people just bring up Kemet and 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 they get uh followers or you know people to listen to them but you know as we always stress you know it's the methodology um like you said he should he should take up some some lessons and learn from somebody that's really qualified um, it's too many people speaking on the language and, and not willing to put down the work and learn the language and it's uh yeah that was basically it. It's 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 kind of sad. I mean, we want people to learn about Kemet, but uh, yeah, it's too many people just using it as a cash cow or a hustle, just to stay relevant. Yeah, I, I thought I found that that was interesting because I share the same sentiment because we see it. We've seen it for the past few years, ever since Kemet on trial, and people want to talk about Kemet, but yet they're so enthusiastic uh, about their opinions about things that they know nothing about. You know, these people are coming along. Johnny come lately uh, uh, half step in their research. Um, you know, they have poor research methods to begin with. But then to apply it to something as complex as uh, Kemet is, is even a double dose of of uh, problems. And so this is what we're seeing. So, again, you know, um, when we see these kind of things, we're going to if, if time permits, because we don't have time to chase all of the claims, you know, a lot. That's 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 one thing that. Um, we need to understand that the that accuracy has a limitation. It has a it has a um, it's countable when you're dealing with inaccurate stuff, misinformation or lies. It becomes infinite. So so you so we have this this um, ratio of a finite situation versus an infinite situation because I can lie about anything. And if I tell a lie. And then and then I and then I make you responsible for proving me wrong, which is backwards. But if I were to do that, then that means I'm, a, I'm putting you to work and then you prove me wrong. Then I come up with another claim and another claim and another claim, another claim. This is why in science it is it doesn't work that way. The burden of proof is always on the claimant for this very reason. And so people don't understand that. So people are making claims left and right and up and down without being held accountable for it. So as the Seshu, as as those of us as a group, we study the language, we are we take it serious and we study it for a reason in lieu of a greater goal. And so we see other people that don't have the same thing in mind. People are studying it just enough to to sit in front of a camera and debate. Yeah, people that are really not interested in it, but they're just they want to know just enough to have a conversation to debate somebody and they fall short every time. And so here's an this is an example uh, I don't know the brother Zion Lex. Um, I never met him um, at all. So this is not a, anything personal with the brother. He pro you know, um, I would love to meet the brother, sit down, break bread with him and even teach the brother um, or whatever. If if, you know, if that's something that um, that he could foresee. But the, the thing is, is that we we can't uh, stand before people in a position of influence and then miseducate them, you know, um, and there's a lot of people who are sincere and mean well, but when you when mistakes are made, you have to acknowledge them and um, 
do your best not to make the same mistakes. And so my overall suggestion is what I said earlier. I suggest that the brother um, takes a time out on the autodidactism of learning languages on his own and, and get up under the wings of somebody who's competent and proficient. Doesn't have to be me, but anybody who's competent and proficient. Because in two and a half years, June, how, how long have you been studying? When did you take the course? Oh, uh, man. O over three, maybe three, over three years ago. It's right around, huh? 2015. Yeah, three, almost three years ago, exactly when I got my certificate, I think. Oh, so, we got our certificate. It's two and a half years, too, I think, somewhere around it's, that. Yeah, it's, it's, a it's, bit. Uh, it's been three years. Because we actually started the class around June or July. I think we finished around September, October, somewhere around that time. And then we actually made the group official around November. So it's been three years. Okay, so we're going on three years. So so uh, September, we're coming up on September. So September will make it like three years. So you all have been studying uh, for for the length of time that he says he's been studying. But as you can see, the difference in the quality of what you all are capable of versus the mistakes that he's making. These are mistakes that people making at the at the onset of learning, not something that somebody who's been studying for three years um, have. So that needs to be made clear. And I and I'm only saying it because we have to show we have to lead by example and we have to show people that it could be done. Nothing to, to be intimidated by. It's 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 easy, but it takes dedication and it takes a sincere yeah. um desire to learn not to learn just to debate and this is the, the the mistake i see a lot of people make including uh zion lex from at least from what i see in a couple of videos that i have seen of the brother when he talks about hebrew stuff see we don't get in the lane of hebrew he you know when people talk about hebrew and the bible and the tanakh and the torah and and the hebrew language itself and stuff like that you know you don't see us over in that lane professing and and doing this and doing that now there are people who do that and so, you know, I guess that's where the the um, back and forth and, and the opposition comes from. But so we're not here for that. So I want to make that clear for those who are watching this video. We're not here. We're not debating. You know, me personally, I don't debate. I know how to debate. I come from a background of debating uh, on an amateur level um, at school, at college level debating and as a paralegal in the courtroom. So I know all about debating and have done it and have never lost a debate that I've personally been involved with. But a real debate is not what we're seeing. So I don't do the debate thing. So if, if, if I don't see a person that is on a competent level with me, then I, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I, I take the stance of John Henry Clark in his famous statement where he says, um, uh, I only debate my equals and all others I teach. And that's not a, you know, that may seem arrogant, but that's a way to just save time because I'd rather teach somebody who's not proficient and competent than to sit there and try to debate somebody who, who thinks they know what they're talking about. You know, that's, that's the difference. So we can all work together and educate the more masses of people. If we, um, you know, be a little more humble and, and have these discussions as opposed to be an, an opposite or open, uh, enemy and try to debate in that way. All right. So, Anyway, that's that's all I have to say. But uh, anybody else had anything? Yeah, I I, I just want to say, man, um, that uh, you know, well, first I want to just ask the, the people in the chat, man, and not only just the people in the chat, but me and everybody on the panel, and everybody with the set shoe. Um, but first, the people in the chat, let's you know, let's start sharing our videos more. And I mean, uh, I'm asking the chat, can y'all help us share the videos? And I think we need to start sharing our videos more. Uh, in these different groups that uh that we in on fake on the social media networks um because a lot of these stuff we done and, and we actually didn't deal with we actually done talked about we actually done transliterated and translated trans uh, literated and translated a lot of these a lot of these gifts like this thing we just went over uh with uh Lex and this glyph we did this what two years ago maybe three years ago we did this glyph we talked about this glyph we transliter transliterated and translated this glyph and it's just funny to me we got all this content out here and people are still i don't know still i don't know um i don't i can't even word it man but we just got to start doing better with um sharing the videos um 
or even just redoing some of the videos because I know at the time when we started out, a lot of people wasn't too much aware of who the Seshu Ma'ani Metanetra was, but now people, you know, know who we are. I think we might need to start resharing the videos or redoing, going live and redoing um, some of these videos. And this video wasn't to attack uh, Zion Lex. It was just to go over some of his uh, information that was not correct. And we have to start to understand that no one is above critique. And when you put information out there in the public, you are asking for it to be critique. And sometimes, well, with me, just speaking for me, critique is it's good for us. I, I, I say that all the time when I'm doing presentations. I don't mind you critiquing my information. I put a disclaimer out there and I tell them, do the disclaimer. I don't mind changing my information or updating my information or even being critiqued by someone. Critique my sources, vid my sources, go through my information because it can only, only thing it can do, it can make us better. You know what I'm saying? The only thing it can do is, you know, so like I said, make us better. We learn from each we learn from each other. So again, this video wasn't about just putting on the record. It wasn't to attack Zion less because I know how people are when you critique their information. People get in their feelings when they critique their information. So they come back and they talk about you and your mama and your kids and biting off your neck and your ears. And that's not good character. We demonstrate good character. So again, this video was about uh, bashing, which we did not bash uh, Zion less. We just went over his information. I didn't have too much to say because I I didn't look at the video. And be honest with you, I'm probably not going to look at the video. But um, we just got to do better with sharing, sharing our videos, man, and getting our videos out there because I know people are just not catching up with who the session is. And we, myself and everybody on the panel, I think we just got to do better with resharing these videos every day or every other day sharing them on these social media networks and I'm asking the people in the chat if you support us start sharing our videos and maybe if we you know we start sharing our videos we won't have a lot of these people or these so-called uh session media netters scholars or so-called scholars coming out and saying some of these ridiculous things that's all I had to say uh that was good that was good and uh I share the same sentiment period so Really nothing to add to that. Um, we do have to do better. Um, I do think that the Seshu Mahdi Meta Nature, I think we're, we're like the, the conscious community's best kept secret. Like, you know, people want to keep us uh, behind the curtain and whatnot. Uh, and, and you know, I have a thought about that. I think that, see, a lot of times what we talk about, because anybody who watches our, our uh, come to our YouTube channel and look at our archives, our videos, a lot of things we talk about, we're not attacking anyone. In particular, you know, we don't, you know, um, but what we talk about uh, actually goes against some of the things that people do uh, uh, teach about and everything. Like Ajun said, people step forward and, and say what they want to say about Kemet and we show and, and demonstrate the other opposite. And so it may be perceived as stepping on people's toes. And so, you know, whenever you have that, you know, you don't want to broadcast that because people want to stay relevant people want to stay important and stuff like that they don't they don't want to understand that okay wait there's a group of people out here that i need to team up with so we're looking for people to um come on board collectively together we're not looking for enemies you know um like i said even what you said uh we're not attacking the brother zion lex i never met the brother i don't i don't know him he don't know me at all we don't know each other whatsoever and i don't think anybody on the panel has ever met him um, and so it's not about him. It's the claims that are made because it could be anybody, any Joe Blow, whatever. It's the claims that are made and then people that are in a, a position of influence and are um, influencing others. And, and we know how things are. We're lazy in general and we don't check out anything. And if you are um, popular or likable and things like that then what you say can be taken to heart by people and so knowing that you should take extra precaution to make sure what comes out your mouth is as accurate as possible it's not to say that we're perfect and we won't make mistakes but even in the commission of of making errors and mistakes we should be humble enough to accept it and say okay my bad i made a mistake thank you for the correction and 
you know, blah, 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 and learn from it. Because, you know, it's not about making errors. It's about how you bounce back. That's what scholarship is about. Scholarship, you know, even in science, science, you're trying to, to disprove your hypotheses. You're trying to falsify everything, you know? So anyway, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good way to um, kind of end our um, show. And again, so, uh, oh, by the way, just real quick, let me actually put this on the screen. I should have had this showing the whole time I was talking here. Um, because we talked about uh, competent uh, teaching and teachers or whatever the case is. So uh, for those who may not know, we have a website, which is the home of the Seshu Ma'ani Medu Nature, and it's the seshmedunature.com. All right, seshmedunature.com. On this site is where we have um, various different transliterations, translations. It's like a one-stop shop for, for resources and things about Kemet, about the language and everything. OK, um, if you want to learn the language, we have a beginner's course on SableUniversity.com. Again, at SableUniversity.com, uh, the course is only one hundred dollars on a beginner's level. It will last you. It uh, will take you approximately 12 weeks to complete. But you can actually do it faster than that because you can go at your own pace. The only requirement is that you. Um, have your interest to learn it and you have to have the textbook because the course is based on the textbook that's why the textbook was written as a as a um as a tool to actually walk you through a beginner's level of the, of the study so those are the only requirements it's only a hundred dollars all right um soon to come we have we ha also have a course on how to write the language or the writing system and also we're going to start uh, teaching the grammar, which is a more advanced uh, level of study. All right, so those are going to be coming up in the near future. But for those who want to learn, Saber University is is the place to go, and you can sign up at any time. All right, and what it is, you study at your own pace. You take the quizzes in the back of each chapter online, and twice a week, the teacher, which is right now is myself, I meet with uh, students um, twice a week. And I will accommodate, you know, people's time or whatever the case is. And you have access to to um, clarify things, to get your questions answered. And we have nice discussions about the culture and so on and so forth. This is like uh, twice a week. If you can't make it twice a week, there's no bother because you can write down your questions and ask them anytime. So if you've ever signed up or have ever been a student um, of the course, you can join in. And that's the benefit of studying together is that you hear the questions of other students that you may not have thought of and hear the answers and you learn. Everyone's learning. OK, so it's open to any student who has ever signed up. So um, and I'll make those announcements as far as the time uh, that we all get together and we just have a nice um, build session. All right. So with that, um, does anybody have anything else to say? Nope. All right. So uh, just last check on the comments. Was there anything in the comments? Nope. All right. Yes. Yeah, Jehudi Ma'adi says Solomon will have a Hebrew on his show to discuss Medinetra, but it won't attempt to reach out to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know. That's that's OK. All right. So with that, um, hopefully, hopefully everyone benefit from this. Share it, you know, um, and if we if you feel that we've made any mistakes at all, you know, we welcome that, um, you know, leave a comment, uh, give a thumbs up if you like it. If you if you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. Hey, but uh, don't thumb it down and not say anything. Tell us why, because with us, it's about advancement. It's about improvement. It's about when you know better, you do better. All right. So that's what it's all about. And with that, um, I guess we will end our uh, show and uh, we take any suggestions as well. All right. Because the video that we just um, try to touch on a little bit was I think it was about three hours long. It's, it's a lot to go through and we're just not really going to um, have the time to go through everything. I just wanted to point out uh, those couple of things I did. And our son of Emiket did an excellent job of pointing um, those things out. That should be a lesson to everyone. Read 
your citations in full because a lot of people do that. I noticed that their citations will speak against what they're saying. They just don't know it. All right. So with that, I will say Shimon Hotep and I'll see you all next time.